to talk to you today about how to achieve OpenStack high availability and reliability. When I was crafting up the set of slides, now I'm a techie, so I don't do lots of pictures. Um, well, I was thinking, right, what's the title? I was also thinking, how about high availability and reliability for something simple called OpenStack? And then another potential title was, I don't see why OpenStack high availability and reliability should be hard. And in any case, that helps me distill the message for today. But let's look at very simple question. What does OpenStack offer us? It's flexible compute storage networking. Yeah? And it's instantly available. It's all great. Yes? And what we're actually doing is we're mat right matching resources to demand. Financially efficient. This is great with an organization. However, this comes with certain new expectations. The new expectations is that it should be on demand and it should just work. As well, there are new roles, the operator versus the consumer. The operator's role is in solely in the operation of underlying infrastructure. The operator's responsibility is to provide the virtualized resources, and it stops at that. The operator doesn't care about what goes on within the virtualized environment. Conversely, the consumer, their, own, their sole responsibility is within the virtualized environment. The consumer doesn't care about what's the underlying infrastructure, doesn't care about what it takes to provide a cloud environment. As far as the consumer is concerned, it should just work. Simple, right? So therefore, it is the operator's responsibility to keep this thing running. Now, however, it is the, in the event that a certain service is dead, that service, that expectation is no longer met. <coughs> um, you may come up to me and tell me that this is a very dark presentation later because I'm going to talk about lots of death. So, in essence, dead is not an option. If it's dead, it's too late. So, when could there be risk of death? So, let's park that question. Let's look at life cycle of OpenStack. We have deploy, operate, and upgrade. Right? In the deploy phase, yes, it can be a challenge. And if you mess up the solution architecture, it will come back and bite you. And no, you will not find out that you've messed up until much later. In the operate phase, on the other hand, you just keep the services running. And really, here, high availability isn't a luxury. It's a must. So the risk of death is when services encountering problems and impacting consumers, right? What about, what about upgrade? Well, upgrade is essentially you've got two options. You either, do, sorry, you either do two N upgrades over N years, or you do two N upgrades once every N years 
later. Um, it doesn't actually eliminate you from having to do those two end upgrades. So therefore, it's probably a better idea to do the first option, which is two end upgrade over n years. What about the risk of death? Aha, downtime and interruption during upgrades. Worse, if any workload gets killed. Um, I was talking to a, let's remain unnamed, well-known, large European research facility. They were talking about uh, upgrade. And their concept of upgrade was, let's bring up the second cluster. So we currently have first cluster, let's bring up second cluster. Let's go and kill all the VMs on the first cluster and get them to go restart it on the second one. That's called upgrade. That's a joke. But hey. It's not a joke, it's called replacement, which is an expensive form of upgrade. <laughs> well, Sometimes replacement is Technically visible, upgrade is not visible, so you go for replacement. Sure. You sell your old car, you buy a new car. <laughs> 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 Certainly. Aha, <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. but your, as far as your service consumers are concerned, they shouldn't be concerned that you are performing certain upgrades because, frankly, the consumer doesn't care. It's not seamless. Right. So, if we then look back, in totality, the risk of death is essentially throughout the phases of up operate and upgrade, right? So the death during upgrade phase is quite simply defined. If you want zero downtime upgrade and the solution architecture that you implemented way back in deploy phase, that's got to meet the requirement. So this is one of those situations where if you mess up in a solution architecture way back in deploy phase, that's when it's going to bite you. Then, if we look at the operate phase, the death during operate phase, you've got two types of death risks. Intrinsic risk versus extrin extrinsic risk. So what about extri extrinsic death risk? It's quite simple. You deal with it via highly available solution architecture because the death risk is external. So what is OpenStack? It's basically a bunch of intercommunicating services. Talking through what? HTTP and MQ. Anything else? Nope. So then, let's look at the type of services. You got two types of services. Those with data and configuration, and those with configuration only. So, therefore, for configuration only, sorry, for configuration, the safeguards need to be infrastructure as code operating model. That's not an option. And you must be able to deploy all the components simply by rerunning a deployer. What about data? The data part, simple. Replication, replication, replication. And your options, either the two node model or the quorum or odd node model. It's nothing else. So for data, safeguards is really using traditional HA operations model. Anything else? <coughs> what else? 
It's a web server. Let's treat it as such. Let's not try to make it any more complex. So for web servers, for the HTTP part, run it with high availability for web servers. Just as we do for any other web servers. For the MQ part, what's MQ? You put stuff in, you take stuff out. So how are we going to get HA for this? You replicate the reader writer. Yeah? So extrinsic death risk, therefore, is to keep extra copies available at all times. Relatively simple. Is that all? Yep. No magic to it. The smarts, it's actually in the solution architecture. What about intrinsic death risk? This is the interesting part where the risk is actually intrinsic to the service itself. It's not externally triggered, which means no, you cannot use HA models. And how do we deal with this? The traditional IT operation model is to monitor, alert, and action, right? And for monitoring, we're essentially looking for dead or alive. If it looks dead, we're not sure, go check again, check three times, and you come back, aha, it is really dead. And then we go alert and then we hope that some action will be taken. But if it's dead, <coughs> it's too late because your service consumers are already affected by that point in time. So intrinsic death risk you cannot use high HA architectures. It just won't be sufficient. What do we need? We need to find out not dead, but sick. Sick, but not dead. So sick state is where it's alive, just not healthy, right? Now, um, further, we need to know the correlation between X and Y. We don't want to just know the causality. Causality relationships are simple, comparatively. And we also need to know when it's actual correlation and when we're dealing with Rolex watch syndrome. Anybody here familiar with Rolex watch syndrome? No? We have one in the audience. Um, Rolex watch syndrome is as follows. Many men admitted to the hospital for heart attacks wear Rolex watches. So therefore, Rolex watch must be the cause of heart attacks. That's not true, right? So we need to know when we're dealing with real correlation versus Rolex watch syndrome. And then we switch to look at What's OpenStack open stack architecture? This is a very simplified model. <laughs> and with that, how on earth are we going to work out 
causality and correlation. This is a mess. So if we then look at this as a computational task, um, we then see, right, it's a non-trivial computational task. Further, sick in one environment is not necessarily sick in another environment. So, no, you can't go and define a bunch of rules and hope that it's going to work. Just won't. Don't dream of it. So let's take this problem one step further. In order to drive this, what do we need? In order to make any decision, we need data, right? Okay. So then, we've got two types of data. We've got metrics and we've got logs. Simple. And we need to be able to take, let's say, the response time behavior of certain web service plus disk smart errors. And we need to be able to detect six states that are otherwise below the radar. So if you look at uh, the traditional threshold-based monitoring, if you define alert in the event that you have three disk smart errors per hour, what happens if you actually have one smart error an hour and you just fly below the radar? And then kaboom, the thing is gone. And you've got a problem on your hands. So, right, how are we going to do this? The statement is quite simple. We take a bunch of logs, we shove it in to some store, and we read these logs out from the OpenStack infrastructure, and uh, uh, we also take in certain metrics, we shove it into some time series store. Yeah? And then we watch the log data for anomalies. So it's analogous to, say, for example, um, you take x-ray pictures of a patient continuously, and you feed this through certain decision engine. And then if you detect that there are certain dark spots in a chest, for example, aha, you say, the patient is sick. But there are also situations when, you know, there are dark spots and the doctor says, yeah, that's fine, go home. We've seen that in real life all the time. And we've got similar situations here as well. Further, if the decision engine gets it wrong, we want to retrain it. And next time, if we detect those dark spots again, now we want to know, aha, it is sick, or it's not sick. <coughs> so, in order to make such decision, we construct effectively certain picture data. And the picture then covers a certain configurable time window. You take, off, you take the, the log data, you take the metrics, you construct a certain view, and you run it through a decision engine to, de to make decision on is this a picture of health or sickness. And if you get it wrong, the operator retrains.
there are some shortcuts that we can take. So for example, as in the case of a patient, we need the patient to be alive before we spend some time to go and detect whether the patient is sick or not, right? We do the same thing here. So if we know that a particular service is already dead, there is no point in even running any computation to figure out whether it's sick or not. And we can also leverage causality relationships to make decisions. Um, causality relationship is something that can be automated. The map of the relationship, we automate it. And once you, we automate that, this is a shortcut that we can use, right? And since that I believe that we're hopefully not building a toy, we need this system to be highly available. And no, 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 we can't use polling. We need to operate on certain push data streams. Further, we need some way of handling back pressure of data so that we don't end up overloading the pipeline. And we need it to be horizontally scalable. And we need to also be able to load balance across multiple backends. Um, then you think, hang on a second. <coughs> we need to do high availability for an evaluation system? What does that sound like to you? That sounds like high availability for processors. Does that still sound simple? Not so simple anymore, right? So how much data are we talking about? If we assume that we've got four bytes per metric and we've got running on 24 cores per node, and we run four VMs per core, plus with 200 plus VMs, sorry, 200 plus metrics per VM, that's 400, sorry, it's 44 gigabytes a second that we're gonna shove through the network. And not so simple. On the log side, that's simpler. Here, over an hour, net, we're going to be moving approximately 72 gigs an hour read-write. Not difficult. So where are the smarts? The smarts is in reducing the data ingest on the metric side. And then on the we also have a problem of imbalance I.O. Because what we'll end up having is we'll have huge number of very little writes. And then on the read side, we're going to have small numbers of very large reads. This is the kind of requirements that don't suit the common uh, NoSQL databases very well. Certainly don't suit a lot of time series databases very well. But if we deal with the risk of death, we can then know imminent faults. And it allows us to deal with the threat when it's still latent rather than when the threat is already patent. Um, the Overall, we can then meet consumer expectations. And some people may say it halts the lots and lots and lots of angry telephone calls also. Um, 
really, this is averting death. There are a number of other challenges as well in the life cycle. So we've, I've mentioned about uh, ease, of, ease and flexibility of deployment, needs to be item potent, so needs to be applied once and once only. And resource management is also an interesting problem. And I've talked about, I've mentioned zero downtime upgrade. I've heard amongst people today that uh, deployment is still hard for some people. Really, what we need to get to is zero to show time in one cup of coffee. And high availability shouldn't be an option. It should be default. We're not playing with toys here. Now, on resource management aspect, where we should end up, where we should get to, is an operating system space model, facility-wide. Now, when you start a web browser on your laptop, do you tell the machine how much CPU you need and how much memory you need? Nope. So why do we manage resources across OpenStack that way? Can we do it smarter? The answer is yes. And if we can achieve that sort of flexibility in managing resources across the facility, <coughs> overall OPEX and CAPEX comes down. So one common example is that if you have a 16 vCPU node, you allocate 16 VMs, one vCPU each. <coughs> the guy who, who's supposed to use those VMs takes off on holiday for three weeks. As far as OpenStack is concerned, that's fully occupied. However, it's a fully occupied idle node. It's a complete waste of resource. If we manage things a little bit smarter, that goes away. But that's topics for another day. This is our DNA systems. This is what we do. Using AI to drive efficiency within data centers, to drive reliability in data centers. Customers in finance, government, and aerospace uses to run sizable data centers. Um, some of them run multiple facilities as a single platform, not multiple facilities as different clouds. That sort of operation drives, demands much, much higher scalability. Some of the example customers, um, a certain top 10 trader on the New York market, um, one of the top five UK academic sites, and uh, 150,000 VMs, single site. Some customers, some classified government customers. And my name is Kenneth Tan. Thank you. Questions? Can you tell us an overview about how do you use or apply uh, artificial intelligence in your infrastructure? Ah, right. Okay. So notice that I've talked a lot, mostly on concepts rather than actual implementations. Now, um, I'll give you an idea. To to start with, if you look at an analogous problem. Spam detection. What spam for me 
is not necessarily spam for you, and vice versa. That's an, a simple example of one of those gray situations. We've taken the gray situation to full extremes. But if you use the, uh, uh, the concept from spam, for example, um, a, the <coughs> document a mail in spam detection is effectively picture data. And in our case, certain logs. And then with the picture, you can then decide, does this look like a healthy state or not? And similar to, to handling spam, you're not looking for statically defined structures. Fuzzy. Um, we've developed a lot of IP in those areas for these kinds of purposes. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. So we are detecting interesting problems. So the data stream or the measurement stream has to be initiated from the server at the end inside, right? No. Everything that we do, we do not touch the VMs, but only sitting on whole side. You were saying that for HTTP response time, we're measuring that, for example. That's why I, I, I asked that. Ah, this is looking at each of the OpenStack services as just a web server. Oh, that's a different study. Yeah. But we are looking for the, the hosted services, uh, right? And not the OpenStack services. No, no, this is OpenStack services because we are looking at the operator. So a certain OpenStack service dies, the whole system has a problem. And you need to know when that those services are sick, but not dead. Yeah, so we're, we're not checking the services, the hosted services themselves. That's right. We're not. We're not. Okay. The operator isn't responsible for whatever that runs inside a VM. Yeah? Any other questions?